let me take you back in time. The year was 2009. The first decade of the new millennium was drawing to a close. It was the only time an Xbox model had been more popular than its PlayStation counterpart, and it was the beginning of the golden age of Assassin's Creed. The age of Ezio Auditore, perhaps the most beloved assassin there has ever been. An assassin so great that after a bit of a shaky first attempt, he managed to put the series on the map and get his very own trilogy of games. Okay, let's get started. Oh, what's this? Uh, 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 that's, that's okay, I guess. Leave it to Ubisoft to make you work to start a game. Three hours later. Okay, now that we can finally get started, let's talk about a few things I learned, some good and some not so good, when I recently cleared the Ezio collection from my backlog. I always forget just how much they invested in the modern day plot back then. I kind of miss that, if for no other reason than they actually seemed to know what they were doing. And honestly, I'm just a sucker for anything with Kristen Bell. The modern day plot really did used to be the anchor for the whole thing. Obviously the adventures in the past were the star of the show, but they were all contributing to a greater purpose. Before the end of 2012, there was an embarrassingly large number of real-world people who thought the world was going to end, because apparently that's what happens when calendars run out. And the Assassin's Creed games really tapped into all of that, and they used it to set up a very intriguing premise about the ones who came before. The continuity between the games was also top-notch at this point. Using the villa as your base of operations in Brotherhood was such a wonderful contrast between the past and the present. It didn't take long for the modern day story to go spectacularly tits up, but the early Ezio days did it well, and the bants between Nolan North and Kristen Bell was top notch too. How come you don't have to get wet? Because you're here. Okay, so before I go into how overall brilliant Assassin's Creed 2 is, I need to take a moment to acknowledge that here it's mildly horrifying. Remember how you started the game as a baby? It is a boy! You witnessed the literal birth of Ezio, and through the power of the Animus, control his very first movements. Oh, and just FYI, when a baby cries in real life, saying that they have a fine set of lungs in a bad Italian accent isn't as well received as you think it's going to be. Listen to him! <laughs> a fine set of lungs! When people complained that AC1 was boring, this was feedback very clearly taken to heart. Instead of a structured and clinical introduction to your moveset, this time you have an organic one, through the everyday trials and tribulations of a privileged but very capable young man during the Italian Renaissance. Like taking part in a brawl for family honour, casual parkour, and closing out the day with a healthy outlet. You know, normal stuff. You should find an outlet. I have plenty of outlets. I meant besides vaginas. Also, remember how long it used to take just to loot one enemy? Mm, Ezio was just being really thorough, I guess. We already committed murder, we might as well rob his ass! Of course, we all know that the introduction takes you barreling straight into a Templar conspiracy, and the very sudden and horrifying loss of your father and brothers. Father! Assassin's Creed 2 was a focused and narrative-driven adventure. Following Ezio's revenge against his family's executioner, he discovers the man was merely a pawn in a much larger plot. The next few hours have him learning skills from unlikely allies, and setting up base in a new hub area, run by this guy. It's a me, Mario! Your Uncle Mario fills in the blanks for you, completes your training, and sets you up on a larger mission for the rest of the game. Whilst there were some side quests to do, you largely just progress through the main story, and that was enough to see you through. If you ask people about the main story of most of the Assassin's Creed games, they might struggle to tell you much beyond when the game was set or what the character was called, but when you look back on Assassin's Creed 2, everybody remembers the flying machine, and everybody remembers fighting the Pope. One thing that shocked me, and I mean really shocked me, was how well the Ezio games handled after all this time. Yes, the Ezio games are old, but they come from a time when Ubisoft clearly tried a lot harder. I mean, take the fact that courtesans teach you how to blend with crowds and pickpocket, or that thieves teach you how to get comfortable with parkour. 
Someone clearly researched these periods in history, and actually tried to conceive how underground organisations would operate. But look at the villa. It's such a fun little game within a game. Investing in the villa and the town is something introduced as an organic afterthought, but it's an excellent metagame that passively generates income for you. Nowadays, they think they can just give you cute animal sidekicks and call it a sequel. Oh, who am I kidding? Chorizo is obviously the goodest boy. <coughs> Brotherhood was a bigger step up than you remember. If you jump straight from 2 to Brotherhood, you will notice an immediate leap in quality. This time around, there was a lot more side content to get stuck into. This included some pretty cool standalone adventures for the likes of returning favourite Leonardo da Vinci, but mostly it was all about the reoccurring metagames. Instead of investing in your villa, you invested in the city, renovating shops and banks and landmarks and such, but before you could invest in an area, you had to take control of it back from the Borgia. Once you had control of an area, you could then see what opportunities were available for you. Things like this were so cool back then. It wasn't just about making a sequel, it was about expanding on what was already great and adding in quality of life improvements. I realise I have just described so many of the new additions to Brotherhood in a positive light, but they also marked the early days of the Ubisoft copy and paste mentality. I get it. If you make something and your customers respond to it, your instinct is to try and do more of it. I know that I've certainly been guilty of this, and I imagine the same can be said of every other content creator ever. All of the new ideas introduced in Brotherhood were good at the time, but even within Brotherhood itself, they started to wear a bit thin by the end. To give an example, the climbing was a lot more methodical back then. You had to actually look for the correct nooks and handholds to grab on your way up. It wasn't like Odyssey, when you can just point Cassandra at basically any vertical surface and watch her go full Spider-Man on it. The point being, when you got to the later towers, the developers made them increasingly awkward to climb to showcase the rising challenge as you neared the end of the game. If there weren't so many of the towers to begin with, perhaps they could have struck a better balance between challenging and annoying. After Assassin's Creed 2 delivered such a phenomenal, massive but mostly narratively driven adventure, Brotherhood delivered something more akin to a playground with a list of things to do. Again, it wasn't all bad, far from it, but it did unfortunately set a bad precedent for future game design. Revelations is hugely underrated. Believe me, I know this game has a lot of issues and I will be getting to them, but it really, really does not get the credit that it deserves. For one, this opening scene is completely epic. Ezio might be on the mature side of things, but he's still an unstoppable badass. Even though they effectively made the entirety of your time in Constantinople a freaking side quest just to collect Altair's door keys. And I adored seeing Ezio as an older, more introspective assassin. When he wrote the letters to Claudia between key story beats to keep you up to speed, it was a great way to showcase his human side, and seeing his relationship blossom with Sophia was a nice touch as well. But if we're going to talk about the Revelations plot, I have to first give a major spoiler warning for this now 13 year old game, because we're about to talk about the ending. Seeing the end of Altair's life is one thing, where the badass original mentor reclaims his territory and literally takes his story to the grave, but seeing Ezio come face to face with his corpse was something else entirely. It was such a poignant moment for Ezio, to finally take off his blades, deciding in that moment that he had seen enough to be able to finally give up the fight. But come on, nobody, and I mean nobody, expected the pseudo fourth wall break where Ezio talks to Desmond. Maybe you will be the one to make all this suffering worth something in the end. Now, listen. Ezio has had a lot of time to reflect since his fight with the Pope and it takes a hell of a person to acknowledge that their entire life, everything they have fought for, may well have been little more than a delivery mechanism for a message to someone in the future. And not what you are saying makes sense. Our words are not meant for you. What are you talking about? There's no one else here. In the grand cosmic scheme of things, Ezio's life was an email, but he was okay with it. It was a powerful ending to an exceptional protagonist, and if nothing else, Revelations deserves credit for this. So despite my defense of Revelations, it's one of the few AC games that I have only played once, 
and coming back to it for the Ezio collection really did highlight just how hard it tried to innovate, and separate itself from the previous adventures. Everything handled smoother, the chain kills were more devastating than ever, and you had a multi-stage vehicle chase sequence before you even left the starting area. Then there was the bomb crafting and the den defense game and the hook blade, which I am so freaking annoyed never made it into later games. At this point in his life, Ezio is bordering on Batman and I freaking loved it. If you're familiar with Revelations, you know there's a book coming, and here it is. It was all just far too much. You see, any time you invest in something, your notoriety goes up, so you can either bribe a town crier or rip down wanted posters and all that jazz, or you can just let it continue to rise, and eventually be forced into another Den Defense game. Oh, and if you want to hold an area that you have captured, you need to assign one of your trainee assassins to guard it, but then you also need to do some side missions for them before you can rank them high enough to be a guard, and I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted just describing this. This used to be so easy. The ideas here were solid, but the execution was just too much. And at a certain point, you just end up mainlining the story missions to see how it ends. Let's end this on a more positive note, shall we? And talk about Ezio's epilogue. So beloved was Ezio, we were treated to a short film, showing the end of his life. Not every assassin gets to settle down peacefully. Altair spent most of his twilight years in hiding. Adewale was killed by you in Assassin's Creed Rogue, and Achilles spent a good chunk of his later life miserable, having brought about the death of thousands and the ruin of the North American chapter of the Brotherhood. Also, he had to live with a limp, because what else would you expect from a character called Achilles? Ezio, for many AC fans, is their undisputed favourite protagonist. He introduced so many of us to the series. Even today, the Ezio games are widely recognised as being some of the very highest highs that this series has ever reached. Revisiting Ezio has been a very interesting experience. When Ubisoft get it right, they really get it right. I look back at my other favourites, the likes of Black Flag and Syndicate and Odyssey, and it has given me hope for the future of this franchise, and I really, really hope that Shadows is a return to form. Tell me guys, which Assassin's Creed game is your favourite? Who's your best protagonist? And are you planning to pick up Shadows and give this series another chance? Thank you as always for supporting my channel you guys. Don't forget you can follow along with my backlog journey using the link down below. See you on the next one.